So I think this class is meant to start at 9.20. It's a slightly strange time, but uh, I thought classes always started at <laughs> on the half hour or the hour. But anyway, um, we, we should probably get started. I will um, make some introductory remarks and then ask if you have any questions, cosmic questions, which I've hadn't thought to answer. So let me bring up a slide deck. All right, so um, this is um, this combined class of E534, 434, and I423. And um, it's called Big Data Applications and Analytics. And it used to say machine learning, and now I've sort of changed it to deep learning because in many fields, deep learning has supplanted previous methods. All right, so th this, um, this slide describes the topics. And uh, this, has, uh, this course, unfortunately, has been taught since around actually 2013. And um, it, uh, as we all see, it has, some things have changed drastically and some things haven't. So, the general philosophy was is to um, go through big data and it's uh, the methodologies of addressing big data with an application emphasis. And as, I, as I've already mentioned, there, there has been in the last three few years a significant shift to deep learning and also when we started, cloud computing was actually quite controversial. Now it's uh, totally dominant. Uh, now the uh, topics we will discuss, uh, the first three, two are pretty old. Um, physics, which was the discovery of the Higgs boson at this accelerator at, in, in Switzerland, CERN. And uh, Actually, as far as I know, it's still pretty accurate. And so we will just use that, those old slides. Uh, there is one which is a little more update than that, but still old, which is called Big Data in Sports. As far as I know, that is still pretty accurate. So we'll use that. And there's one very broad survey, which is still very accurate from the things it surveys, namely the types of applications, but it is it is not accurate in terms of how their their status. However, this was done in a government project I was part of, and as far as I know, nobody has ever redone it. So it's still as accurate as is available. Sometimes we talk about sensors and edge systems, and although um, one of the major trends in the world is the move to the edge, um, I don't quite see there's some dr the dramatic things to talk about. So I will not, I will probably not even use that, that module. Uh, three areas which we will certainly use because they're very, uh, ty they're, they're, they're actively being updated. Health informatics, you get no news about the latest uh, COVID-related uh, technology every minute. So that's, that's pretty active. Commerce is also very active because COVID has revolutionized that with increase in um, online groceries and things like that. And 
in the, from this, in the class, I gave a class this spring, which had a big a focus on mobility and transportation systems, uh, which we will, which is an example of the transformation of industry. Automobile companies are no longer automobile companies; they ought to be mobility companies. Then the last four are more technology-based. Cloud computing, I've always taught at a, in an overview and. That, that area is essentially unchanged over the last three years. Um, there are a set of technologies I started with, but those are nearly all out of date, as because I say everything is now deep learning. And then I have two sections which I hadn't used before, one are, which are based on technologies. That's because the deep learning, which is sort of a dominant, tech, a dominant approach, it, it's pretty different for, it's particularly well developed for these two application areas. Those based on images, such as such as um, self-driving cars that are dominated by un interpreting images, uh, surveillance, um, pathology, study of medical images. Those are all really highly advanced and making huge progress as are time series based applications for both medical information and environment. So those are the topics. So, as I mentioned, these classes are cross-listed and um, I, I put up last year's, um, last four years um, <coughs> syllabus and videos and things which we will be gradually updating as we prepare new material. And I will post which material is the right material to, to look at. There are in this uh, cyber training um, GitHub site, various resources, such as how Python, I should say, the only software we will use is based on Python. Um, Linux, you will not use, need, unless you use, unless you do some pretty detailed project. Um, Markdown is the text formatting used in GitHub and Jupyter Notebooks. And um, we will add a module on Jupyter Notebooks because as far as I can see, that is the, most attractive approach to data science and and uh, machine learning that, that there is. I say the course is graded by a set of homeworks, about six to eight homeworks, and a final project. There will be no midterm, and um, the project can either be software or essay style. But the graduate section has to do software if you want to get the highest grades. There is a Piazza site, which most of you have uh, acknowledged, uh, have signed in on. Please, if you have, you should have been invited and please accept that invitation. And um, that's the key organizational details. On Jupyter Notebook, you can run Jupyter Notebooks in various different places. I always use Google Colab, and um, that is either free, and it has some restrictions, or you can pay nine, ten, well, essentially ten dollars a month and get a better, um, better, better machines and less restrictions on your use. Um, I had an undergraduate using Colab over the summer. And he kept on getting thrown off because he had um, he exceeded 12 hours of work per day. And the way you get around that is have lots of Gmail addresses and use Colab pre up to the limit on each Gmail. And the huge advantage of um, notebooks and in particular Jupyter notebooks is you have everything in one place, the code, the documentation, the output. Uh, when you're doing a large project, you will often put a lot of the material in GitHub. 
Otherwise, the material lie usually is, by in Colab is normally accessed from your Google Drive uh, files. Here's an example of my files. I have a file called Colab Notebooks. I just did a screen dump this morning of the work I've done for the last three days. It's August 24th. Every time I run a notebook, I either reuse it and edit it or I save it to this uh, this uh, Google folder. And then here I have, a, I also have a lot of the input data on Google Drive. Here is a large data set from the USGS called Camels, which has a lot of hydrology data, which I was working on. So I'm going to stop this work list here. And well, we're up to 34 participants. And I want to, actually I would like to first ask if there are any cosmic questions about the organization and nature of this course. Either send that to the chat or just ask me now by, by voice. If you have no questions, I will just proceed with this introductory material. In, in general, I think this class on Friday is more a discussion class because everything will be video recorded and placed on YouTube. And usually we use this class, this weekly class to discuss issues in a more informal fashion. I have a question, Greg, if I can go. When will the homework will be due? Well, let's think. We will assign it later today. It will be due. The first homework will be very easy. It will be due in about a week after I assign it. Typically, I'll give you two weeks for this non-trivial homework. And we will just have homework the first two thirds of the of the class, then the last third of the class will be based, will be you working on your project. Any other questions? All right, let me just Right, let me share my file again. Asked about backgrounds. Well, um, I think you can pass this class or get even a reasonable grade with almost no background. Um, and um, as I say, I think the graduate students will be expected to have a more slightly uh, more sophisticated programming background, but the, uh, I say the undergraduates don't have to do programming. And I don't think, but big data is, is I mean, big data has only really existed for maybe eight years as a topic and so I don't think even, and, and this, most people don't have a huge background on it. Jeffrey is a good thing to call me. Every other, uh, they will be due. That's, you're asking, I will make a decision and tell you about the, I will, I will work on a tentative schedule of homeworks and due dates and I will send it out. I will send out those things as Canvas announcements. And please don't send me email mail on Canvas. I don't like Canvas mail. Let me just you know, go back to sharing my screen.
So before continuing with the slide deck, let me just, um, let me just uh, give you this example of um, Jupyter Notebooks. This is research I'm doing at the moment on on time series and um, it's a link to this is given in the class notes and if you're not familiar with notebooks you can see here why they're attractive they have um, in one place they have uh, the software um, the documentation and the results and although this particular notebook doesn't use github you can actually access github to get pre-compiled and high uh, sophisticated software which this used lots of sophisticated software none of my all from google and other play and and the python community and jupyter uh, google has a nice table of contents so if i ha i happen to know that so these and you can see how I've um, got documentation here, meaning of parameters and things. And, and then if I go down, let me go look at the table of contents, transformer for science. So this is the latest code I was working on. And And he, this produces the results here. This is this uh, deep learning network with a million parameters. Striking thing about deep learning networks is how many parameters they have. When, I mean, I've done optimization for in my entire career. And before we had deep learning, we were always very careful about the number of parameters we had. but. Deep learning methods are highly robust and they can have lots of parameters without um, and still work well. And finally here we get the data I'm working on with, with Gregor, which is some COVID data as a function of time. Uh, this particular data sample until May 25th. And um, again, we just use matplotlib, which is a normal Python plotting package to plot the answer of this deep learning fit. So we have in one place, everything gathered together. And um, that's why I find notebooks extremely convenient. Also, I noticed that this particular notebook is based on an original Google notebook for their so-called transformer technology, which is a revolutionary um, technology for for natural language processing, which I'm applying to this uh, new application area. And I was just, a, uh, what I did when I wrote this notebook was I just took their notebook and kept its structure and just modified it. And so actually I have a history as to how my changes map into Google's, uh, Google, what Google did. And um, As an amusing remark about deep learning, you will notice that this COVID data has weekly variations. If you look at these announcements, you will find people neither get infected nor, and even more so, they don't um, die on the weekends, or at least largely Sunday and Monday. And possibly that's a reporting issue, but um, the deep learning network is able to reproduce this strange weekly structure. Deep learning may not be intelligent. It may just, it, it does what it's told to do. If you tell it to reproduce data with a weekly structure, it will reproduce data with a weekly structure, even if possibly it's slightly artificial. Anyway, that's just an aside. So now let's go. So anyway, I encourage, I think uh, it's worth noting the convenience of this model, the computing model, which for me at least is uh, more attractive than previous computing models. So let's go back to the basic discussion. And uh, we will. Sorry, Jeffrey, that I interrupt. Are you recording the session? Yes. Okay. I hope so. 
I can't see, I can't see a signal saying I did, but there was one. Yeah, that's the reason why I'm, why I'm asking. I, I didn't see it. Recording on this computer, there's a little red, there's okay. a blue circle with a red dot. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, we don't see this from the, from here. Okay, great. All right. Well, this slide is trivial, but probably important. And because big data has changed the world in all sorts of ways. And they were, I don't think this change was expected. I don't think people... I think people realized that machine learning was important and that data was important, but not the big data would be so successful as it. I think it's been orders of magnitude more successful than people thought. I don't think people thought that we could get all the information we can from big data. And it has profound impact on the way you think about things because um, big data can tell you can tell you, uh, big data, if you, if you think of a world, let's take a world which is not really discussed here, which I also work on, which is forecasting earthquakes. Now earthquakes are very complicated. They, they happen down in the middle of the earth. They're sensitive to, they, they come from the um, faults of rubbing together and uh, then, they, then they get stuck with, uh, the reason there are no earthquakes is the faults are not moving but that they do put pressure on each other. And every now and then you get an earthquake when that pressure breaks and the, 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 the faults slide apart. Now, to try to write a computer program that uh, predicts that is, well, you can actually write a model computer program that, that um, predicts that type of phenomena but it's not relevant to the real world because you have no idea what about the details of the earth. At least not, not where the faults are rubbing together. We don't know the friction. We don't even know the friction laws down in those environments. And so here is a case where we understand the general physics of what's going on, but it's not possible to uh, predict it. In fact, the Japanese built a famous machine called the Earth Simulator which was, <coughs> which was motivated by predicting earthquakes. Now it actually was a very successful computer, the most powerful one in the world, but it never predicted an earthquake. I don't at least not seriously. And that's because it's not possible to predict an earthquake. And the, it is believed by, I think, most people in the field that the only chance of predicting earthquakes is big data. Because the idea, the point is, we don't know what's in the middle of the earth. However, we see some implications at the middle of the earth from the earthquakes that we record, because uh, earthquakes have magnitudes, and if the magnitude is two to four, it's not very serious, and there are a huge number of those, and they just tell you about the earth. So the hope is that this is a good example of where the data has information which in the machine learning community is called information on hidden variables. And <clears throat> you can use the, um, that data that exists, which is actually in this case, not very big data, but it's non-trivial size data. Um, something, I don't know, 20 million events or something like that. You can use that maybe to try to predict earthquakes. So it's a good example, and of course, if we now come to people buying, buying um, uh, pink t-shirts on a website, it's not so easy to make a theory for why people buy pink t-shirts. However, you have a very good record of who bought pink t-shirts and what they were like and what they did before they bought the t-shirt and things like that. So that's again a hidden variable which is, can be discovered by the data. So big data is so important because it can uh, predict things which uh, are consequences of the past where we have no real um, theory or understanding except a general idea. We know roughly what's, before, what's dependent on what. And um, like in the case of say Netflix with uses recommend, recommender engines to predict your movies to watch um, we, there is some intuition that uh, the movies you watch will be uh, reflect the previous movies you've watched and the ratings you gave them. And also 
uh, if, if, if you have uh, 10 people who see, have similar previous ratings, probably their rating of the 11th movie will be similar. So you have some insights, but no, no sound theory. So big data is solving problems where the, uh, is particularly valuable. This is the big data approach or data-driven analysis where there is um, no theory. Now there's also, like in the Higgs boson, you could say there's a case where you're applying big data techniques to find things which were predicted by theory. I mean, the people are actually unhappy about the Higgs boson because it's too normal. It's exactly what the theory predicted. And people are desperately trying to find effects which are different from what the theory predicts. And um, all right, so that's why big data is important. It can, um, you, and the, the, you, it embodies information. And the fact that we're, we're embodying previous information points out we have to do training. We have to have a set of data uh, information where we have some data and some result. Then we have a set of information about people and we need to know whether they buy pink or blue t-shirts. That information is used to train our neural net, which uh, then predicts whether and the next person will buy which color t-shirt they would like best and things like that. Um, all right, so that's big data. It's really a pretty different approach to the world. And I think now it's pretty well understood, but I say, I don't think it was predicted. I don't think when I started this class in 2013, that philosophy was quite so understood. It was just about becoming, um, becoming known. Now let's, um, now this is true both in industry and commerce and, um, Another interesting feature I should say about this, uh, this whole field is that uh, is incredibly important in industry. And so that means that people who uh, look, work in this field, even they're working say on like I am on scientific data, hydrology data, studying how much the rainfall and things like that. These techniques are also very important in self-driving cars and uh, right hailing business and things like that. And uh, all, all sorts of areas, Netflix, etc. So, and all of those businesses are proportional to the size of the world. So this means suddenly that uh, these, these are a whole area of um, related to big data, or you could call data science. It is an area that is, um, has an vitality and actually funding inside it, which is proportional to the number of people in the world. And that means it's pretty big. And that was never true in the past when I did anything in computing. When I did uh, actually my best known work in computing, parallel computing, that was viewed as an important area, but largely confined to studying science. And there was nothing in it which was proportional to the number of people in the world. And so the funding effort and industry effort into it was quite small. But now anything we do in this class, industry is, industry is inv effectively involved and um, <clears throat> the activity is enormous. And it has to be enormous because companies like Facebook, Google, Microsoft are all fighting to the death to, to win all the various components of this world. <coughs> and they can't afford not, not to put a huge effort into it. So the effort is enormous. And uh, sorry, so that's an important comment. And uh, this, this field, it covers science, where science has theories and science also has areas where they're not so clear theories. And uh, the next bullet number three is about clouds. Well, clouds are pretty interesting. So Gregor and I have worked on clouds for a long time at actually 12 years. So the first commercial cloud was 2008. And then for the next, uh, sort of, I don't know, three or four years after that, we went to go to talks and said, hmm, clouds are 1% of the world at the moment. Maybe they'll be 10% in three years time or something like that. Well, as we'll see on a slide, a couple of slides later on, 
they're now 95% of the world. So clouds are no longer really a research area, those aspects of clouds are, but the concept of clouds is just a fact. And so there is no, there is no innovation in using clouds, you have to use clouds. Like that Google Code Lab is just accessing computers in the Google Cloud. And clouds are actually connected to the edge. And I said I was not going to emphasize the edge. That's partly because clouds embody the edge. The reason people had clouds was because they started off with the web 2.0 activities such as people doing Google searches or Facebook, uh, Facebook links and things like that. And all those were edge people, people at the edge with their, with their phones or desktops. <coughs> and the great power of those systems was they linked the people at the edge to the uh, aggregated information in the clouds. And so clouds cannot exist uh, mo uh, motivated by the edge. They were put in place by Google, et cetera, to service the edge. And so the edge is not really distinct from the clouds. The only thing that's happened more recently is that people have realized the edge is pretty sophisticated. And like a good example is your, is your self-driving car or, or almost self-driving car. Uh, that itself is a huge collection of computers. Uh, often they have an NVIDIA GPU built in for the image processing. And they, they will do some work in the car, some work in the cloud. And the whole thing will be a, a wonderful ecosystem, which is, which is essential to be able to generate self-driving cars. And, and this is clearly a disruptive transformation, which you can actually see again this year, particularly as COVID has added to the disruption but in adding that the disruption is actually emphasizes the big data area because the parts of the economy which are big data oriented have not been disrupted. In fact, they've probably grown because uh, people are doing more things in a digital fashion and less things in a physical fashion. So anyway, we're, um, so we're, the, this is a sort of the philosophy. We're trying to give you a feeling for this world and sometimes this is called being digitally aware or data aware. And um, you need to be uh, not only aware, but uh, able to use the latest advances and have a reasonable low intuition for what, if you have a job, which is most jobs will probably have a, be relevant to big data. You need to know how to use big data and where to use big data. And, uh, as we see at just today, uh, these days, everything is being changed. All right, so that's the motivation of the class. So here's an old slide, which I probably wrote in 2014. And most of this is unchanged. If I looked at the version of the slide now and compared it to the one in 2014, Two things have been added, which uh, data engineering, uh, which I could have added in 2014, but didn't think about it. And deep learning, which I should have added in 2014, but didn't realize that it would be as successful as it is. Deep learning is actually a pretty old area, came from the mm, 30 or 40 years ago, but it, it was really took off around 2014, in fact, uh, with this, uh, around this system called AlexNet, which revolutionized image processing. Um, and if I look at this slide now, the one thing I probably should add is the edge. And I explain sort of why I don't add the word edge, because edge is embodied in the cloud. The cloud is a cloud plus an edge. Um, the computer technology with multi-core was present in 2000, well, certainly in 2014, but also in 2008. And um, the number of clients and the power of the smartphones has increased, but it was, it's still dominant. So those are some trends which underlie all of this. 
And if we look at this slide, there is a little difference between clouds and deep learning. Clouds are just there. There's no longer any doubt. I say you don't really do, we don't, Gregor and I don't do research in clouds. We do research in deep learning, and my students do, uh, which could use clouds, and they're, they're affected by clouds, but they we're not doing cloud research any longer. Uh, here is a nice slide, which Cisco did in 2018. And it's sort of interesting. If you go to this um, Cisco website, Obviously, they decided they were a networking company because you can no longer get this analysis. They've just been replaced by the Google networking analysis, sorry, the Cisco networking analysis, and they no longer discuss clouds. However, this particular Cisco report from 2018 was pretty useful and uh, really tells you um, that uh, Clouds are totally dominant. I have other slides which, um, well, there's actually this first bullet here. They claim by 2021, which is probably, um, I suspect this is accurate because the, the, the dominance of clouds is, is anything got stronger, not less, not, un, un, no, it's not declined. That in a, for the enterprise industry, only by in 2021, only 6% of the computing will be done on traditional systems. 94% um, will be done on private or public clouds. And it's interesting, you see that the cloud part is increasing 22% a year, and the traditional center part is going down 5% each year. And uh, it's this is partly just due to the number of computers, uh, but um, there are more computers in the cloud than there are on in the traditional data center. Actually, nobody knows how many computers there are in the world. I try to estimate and you get numbers like 50 million, but it's very inaccurate because nobody, none of these cloud companies will actually tell you how many computers they have. It's sort of um, and slightly annoying. It's all too secret. They sometimes will give you an indication of how many computers are in one data center, but as they have hundreds of data centers, that's, um, that's not enough to tell you the total. All right, so I, this is, this tells you the number, hyperscale just means big as far as I know, and that probably is a technical definition, but um, uh, it's not, it's, it's used in word in, in analyses where you want to do things at the largest possible scale. Um, and the number of cloud data centers is not 94% of the number of data centers. That's because if you look at the top right, four time, on any one cloud server, you're running four times as much work as you are on a traditional server. That is because of so-called virtualization technology, which allow you to use computers much more efficiently. By the way, you will see that when you will use Google Colab. Actually, earlier this week, I gave up using Colab. They somehow had run out of computers and they were sharing their computers between so many people that, the, that my, my client kept on timing out. I think they've added more computers or else few, some people have gone away or something because it's now the last couple of days have been much better. But anyway, there, there, well, a feature of clouds is shared shared resources, which has some positives and negatives. It's positive, it's cheaper and a more efficient use of resources. So it actually is green, it's saving power. Uh, but the negative is you don't have these dedicated resources, uh, which you can get guaranteed response out of. Um, okay, so that's important. All right, so as a next part of the introduction, we'll, I'll go through something which I normally, I used to do more of, but I would just skim through it uh, this year. The online uh, courses have more, a more detailed discussion of this. And this is Gartner's uh, view of what's important in the world. Gartner's a large company, Maybe some of you will end up working with Gartner, but they have analysts and they analyze technology trends. 
and they are famous for having a hype cycle. And they have hype cycles are these uh, um, things with this interesting shape with a sharp hump, and then a decline, and then they have a slow rise. And then if you look at any idea or technology, it comes from up here. Here it's being studied in universities. It comes up here into startups. It gets incredibly hyped here. People get a bit disillusioned and it falls down. And some things just fall into this trough of, of disillusionment. Here's the names of these things here. Innovation trigger, inflated expectation, disillusionment, enlightenment, and productivity. And um, <clears throat> say uh, here, this over here, we describe the, um, the these various aspects of this curve. Now, I don't actually think it matters too much about this curve. What matters is what's more interesting is what Gartner thinks are in different phases of this hype cycle. And so, if we go to 2019, and I can't spell applications here, but that's life. We will see the, they aren't actually, they sometimes have more and more technologies than this. If you look at these technologies, there are actually a lot of them are relevant to this course. So generated as adversarial networks, that's a deep learning technology. Augmented reality, well augmented reality has been on the uh, hype cycle for an awful long time. It's one of these technologies that never quite seems to uh, realize its promise. <coughs> here are some things here flying autonomous vehicles autonomous driving level four um the, the notes uh, on self-driving cars tell you about these levels but that's, that's essentially perfect drive not per not totally perfect anyway these are actually gardner's quite skeptical about self-driving other people are more up like elon musk are more optimistic and they, they claim 10 years. I don't think it's 10 years, but it's not two years either. But if we look at these things, these, um, here we have, there's lots of talk about SpaceX and Amazon launching satellites, and we have those up here. here but lot of, see how many of these are AI, AI, knowledge graph is AI. Um, while synthetic data is part of big data and motivated by AI. Here's, here again, these are light cargo drones, self-driving transfer learning, deep learning technology, flying vehicles, augmented intelligence, deep learning. Here's an actual non-deep learning, directly nanoscale 3D printing. Um, AI platform as a service. Biochips is a little different. 5G is, again, a little different. It's a communication technology, although it's motivated by big data will allow you to, to have much larger bandwidth in and out of your home so as you can do your cloud computing. Graph analytics, that's AI. Here we have actually a computer technology, next generation memory, 3D sensing cameras. Anyway, if you look at 2019, it's hugely dominated by AI. The word cloud does not appear here. And that's because clouds, even, well, even in 2019, were certainly well defined. They're sitting up here, somewhere in the plateau of productivity, and they do not list things in the plateau of productivity. And there's, Gartner also tells you these various things about whether things are high, their benefit transformational, high or moderate. And um, most of these things up here in the transformation area, AI, like autonomous driving levels four and five. Biotech is artificial tissue. That That's, um, no, but that is for actually, we would believe you need AI to design actually artificial tissue. Uh, so, but all of this stuff here are closely connected to the big data deep learning revolution. And um, this particular slide here tells you uh, how to view these things. So here we have the amount of hype maturity and we add them together to get the hype cycle and then in the priority matrix it, if you have money and you're a venture capitalist or an investor it tells you how to map these technologies into your uh, investment style um, all right 
and um, I would you should stick with transformational property. Though, of course, partners not always right, and sometimes they carefully move things from one category to another as the years go by to recognize their mistake. Also, it's quite interesting. Things often disappear into that trough of disillusionment, and Dartner never mentions them again. I should, uh, so here we wanted to contrast this with what I started off with. This is where Gregor and I started our big work on cloud computing. So this is us. We were in 2008, we got a big federal contract to study cloud computing. And see, here it is, it's still in the innovation level. And um, here's some things that like mobile robots and Actually, they're not, they never quite realized their promise, although they're obviously an aspect of the big data revolution. Service-oriented architectures, that was a very traditional um, distributed computing concept, web services. But even these in 2008 were in the plateau of productivity. Um, and uh, so anyway, if you look, here we have Facebook and things, social commuting platforms. 2008, and this had a priority matrix, and they did correctly predict the cloud computing is, was transformational, which it certainly was, and was two to five years. I think that was about the right time scale as well. A lot of these other ideas, I don't think quite made it. While solid state drives and, and green IT are important. Here is the beginning of this class, 2014. And um, interestingly, data science has entered the um, innovation level. And uh, these other ones have something to do with AI, analytics, big data. Here's big data, just past the inflated expectations. Here we have some technologies of relevance to big data and memory database management systems. There are lots of those. Um, and when I personally like quantum computing, it appeared on Gartner's list for many years. It was always in the more than 10 years, which is a correct evaluation. It's never the, the chance of it being useful in the term is extremely small. Uh, it's, so that's 2014. And um, this slide actually from 2017 has some important concept, digital platforms, AI everywhere, and immersive experiences. And now again, this area here is, I'm not convinced this is important as people say. AI everywhere, however, is the, and digital platforms are critically important. All right, so here is, an, um, I should say, Sometimes it's hard to get these plots because uh, I had a sp subscription to Gartner, which I, which I didn't renew because I couldn't afford it uh, this year. So I had to just grab this from the web and so it's incomplete information. Here is 2020, they just released it uh, in sometime in the beginning of August. And if you look at it, it's got AI, ML, digital twins, that's large scale simulations, but then, probably going to be built using AI, responsible AI, embedded AI, data fabric, explainable AI. Here's something different, carbon-based transistors. Ontology and grass, I wouldn't have put them in there, but um, they're AI. Generative adversarial networks, AI. They had those in the last previous year. So what is this? Namely AI. And there are no clouds and actually no quantum computing even though there was an announcement a few days ago that the federal government was investing a huge amount of money in, AI, in quantum computing research. I'm pretty certain quantum, quantum computing may be inflated expectations. It's not, I don't think it's trough of disillusionment yet or slope of enlightenment. <coughs> we haven't really solved the physics problems of producing significant size quantum machines. Um, okay. Now, as well as um, these global technologies, Gartner does, Gartner has, I think, around 100 hype cycles every year. And then in 2019, I had all of them because I have my subscription. 
And they, you can look in particular at the hype cycle for artificial intelligence. And I'm not certain you learn an awful lot because uh, these are sort of obvious. Here they have put quantum computing, not in the overall hype cycle, but in the AI hype cycle. I'm not certain why they would do that. Because some of it just depends on your analysts. Every one of these uh, curves has analysts attached to it. And each analyst obviously has their own opinion and that gets put into the hype cycles. Um, here we have computer vision. So that's of course the area revolutionized by AI, an incredibly active area. I would put that up here actually, but maybe today. It's pretty mature. GPU accelerators, that's what we get on our Google Cloud. We either get GPU or TPU, Tetsa processing unit, which is Google's version of a GPU. Speech recognition, that's another deep learning application. All right, so that's, uh, they tell you that with the transformational thing, speech recognition is obviously transformational. Um, quantum computing is interesting, it's not transformational. It's certainly high, I would have made, it either fails miserably or it's transformational. I don't think there's any middle ground for quantum computing. And the reasonable fraction of people think it's going to fail. Well, it's not going to fail, it's just not going to be, it. people haven't really found out how to use quantum computing. They haven't found out how to build them and haven't found out how to use them, even if you could build them. Here's a nice one I like, artificial general intelligence. That's just building a, building a, the, the computer, the, the computer mind that knows everything. And it's up there more than 10 years next to autonomous vehicles, which are probably less than 10 years. Here we have cloud computing. So there are still research in cloud. And when I said we, Gregor and I may not be doing research in cloud computing, but there is still non-trivial work. The area I have worked on is serverless computing, which is a very promising way of using clouds. And um, especially for things like, like AI and um, hybrid cloud computing, that's when you use multiple different uh, sites together to produce a single solution. Um, companies like Lilly use that because they, uh, they run their own high performance computing center. And then when that runs out, they just send it off to Amazon to run there. And this is the priority, priority. And notice edge computing is here. I told you really cloud and edge, are, you can't distinguish them. And here's a one to just uh, look at and have some fun. I think it seems to come from Gartner and it's uh, connected, it's trying to make, uh, have some, uh, like stuck up on toilet paper is uh, the beginning of the innovation trigger. And uh, when you're in the plateau of productivity, you're reading a book and doing taxes. High school reunion with Zoom. Okay, viral tweet. Learn Python, you see, that's uh, Okay, so that's, uh, that's the end of this section. So the purpose of that section is to try to get you a feeling as to what is expected. And I say, if I compare, if you look at uh, I, would, I, would, I mean, if you, you could say that Gartner and this course are well matched. Uh, and I've told you that although cloud computing is an important part of this course, it is totally defined because it is 94% of all computing. So it is not innovative. So it's not an emerging technology. Whereas AI is totally, you know, is totally emerging. There have been some huge successes but um, there are many places where it's not quite clear where, where it's, um, uh, how to do it. Like in the case of, um, uh, of say, um, deep learning, we, we know how to, we, we've made some initial steps and in, say, deep learning for a COVID drug discovery. But that work is still right at the start and it's just, it is not universally adopted or even universally agreed on yet. And again, 
self-driving cars, everybody knows, it's all deep learning is a part of that effort. And whether what remains is these new innovations, dramatic breakthroughs, or it's just engineering, train enough data, get the right sensors, which are really reliable in a broad range of climate and uh, traffic conditions. Um, Una, I'm not quite certain. It's a mixture of engineering and, and technology issues. But I think the approach to deep learning, to self-driving cars is well established and well understood and hasn't changed too much. All right, here we have trends. Well, when we again started this class, or versions of this class, which was around 2010, this particular class was, I think, 2013, um, but I gave uh, earlier versions of it, we had beautiful pictures like this, which uh, somebody went to a lot of effort to do some beautiful graphics, trying to summarize how much activity there was, in this case, every minute. Now, um, I told you cloud computing is well established. Well, the fact that there's lots of things happening every minute in the data area is now so well established that people don't draw these pretty pictures any longer. So if you want pretty pictures, you have to go back to, a, to an earlier time. And all you can do is gaze at it and look at the different range of different applications, which are probably still correct. But all the numbers are totally wrong. So, and it's not possible. I mean, you could try to update some of them, but it's not so easy. Here's another one from, uh, <coughs> which has a US, uh, um, very, well, it has a different type of uh, US government data explosion, less consumer oriented. And we have ge genomics and petascale computing and things like that. Uh, this is the US Department of Energy. It's still true that high energy physics is now up to probably 100 petabytes per year. Light sources are probably the most uh, important area because they have many light sources and light sources are what's driving a lot of the material science and biomaterial work that is essential for many of these uh, breakthrough, breakthrough uh, systems. And at better scale, is um, being to actually is now exascale. The first exascale machines will be installed next year. Exascale is a, a thousand times bigger than better scale. And um, we will let, let's see. So anyway, this is next. So anyway, so these are pretty pictures, and all they say is everything is going up. There's a huge amount of data, and it's actually increasing as we go from 2010 to 2020. Now, there's a lady, uh, Mika, I think her name is Mary Mika. And she has, a, she used to have a presentation every year called Internet Trends. <coughs> and that, that, uh, but she didn't have one this year. She had replaced it with a COVID related discussion. She now has her own company. She used to work for Kleiner Perkins, which is a famous uh, venture capital company. And her slide decks, which you can just find by typing Mika, M-E-E-K-E-R, Internet Trends, uh, are hundreds of slides long, and they're just full of pictures. And I selected, I have used a few of these here. And uh, you can find at the bottom and slightly down, this one's 2018, so that's one year. So there is no 2020 version of this as far as I'm aware, I couldn't find it. Um, and, but the, and if you look at her slide decks, they also change dramatically. When you, when you looked at the early ones, you would find the interest, uh, you will find a lot of information like the ones on those previous two slides, core data on what data is big and things like that. The more recent uh, internet trends discussions are much more sophisticated and are looking at uh, second order effects for, for obvious reasons, because that's where the uh, important um, 
That's that's now more. And everybody agrees that big data has happened. There is no discussion. Big data is here. It's getting bigger, and that, that's it. So here we have the um, uh, graph, particular typical graph. This one's actually pretty core information. It's about the uh, percentage penetration of the internet and the percentage penetration across the world of social media. And you can see uh, internet is almost 50%, uh, almost a half, and social media is a third. This was in 2017. Now, this one here is again only up to 2017 or 2018. And it's, uh, well, if you look at it, we've been, they used, I used to love taking photographs and I had a large, a nice Nikon camera, which I used, used to do that. And before that I had a Pentax. But now of course, all photos are taken with cell phones. And they're actually not actually quite as high quality, but they're almost as high quality. Because um, for reasons I haven't fully studied in detail, the quality of the, cell phone cameras is incredibly good. I remember my first smartphone, the camera was awful. I was quite embarrassed. But now anyway, the number of photos has gone up by some huge factor. It used to be that Kodak said that um, life was measured in shoeboxes because people used to keep their photos in shoeboxes. And they, when I, I used to be at Syracuse University and which is near Rochester where Kodak was headquartered. And they had a digital shoebox project to try to replace those shoeboxes by some digital version. Now Kodak, Kodak is a good example of a, of a sad comp a company which was, used to be dominant and it did not cope terribly well with this transition. Although they, they're still alive, they're just not, they're not uh, no longer, they did not do a digital shoebox. The digital shoebox was done by many other people with the online photo um, systems. And Kodak is the reason, one of the reasons this is true is if you have a big company like General Motors, Kodak, uh, Sears, you find it very hard to change. And so it is, uh, it's unfortunately true that as this world develops, lots of very well established, exciting, previously exciting, good companies will disappear. Um, because most innovation happens much better in smaller organizations. And like in the case of General Motors, they always used to be handicapped by having to, um, um, having to make Buick and Cadillac and Chevrolet and Pontiac all coexist happily and not try to compete with each other. In the case of Kodak, they had to be sure that their digital component didn't take away their chemical component because they were critically dependent on the chemical side. Now, unfortunately, that cramped their digital work and then the chemical side disappeared anyway and they were just dead. So, um, I, the, as we discussed actually in the spring class, there's a, a philosophy of, uh, of innovation that's uh, quite interesting, which is you buy the innovation. Now, that's been, it's very clear that's happening in the banking industry where there's a huge number of so-called fintechs, financial technology companies. And a lot of them are actually funded by existing banks and the existing banks, banks funds fintechs, it watches them. And then it just, when one is like Robin Hood is successful, they'll try to buy it. Um, and, um, that's an interesting approach, which uh, it also can be used in other areas and is used in other areas. But uh, I don't think Tesla is selling itself to General Motors in the future, partly because Tesla's worth, a, according to Wall Street, Tesla's worth an all, uh, significantly more than, uh, I don't know, Tesla's stock has been increasing quite dramatically. But um, maybe it's five times General Motors ca capitalization on Wall Street. I don't know exactly. Anyway, there's a huge, these changes are enormous. Anyway, for images, the number of images is just dramatic. You've gone from a very small number, say measured in shoeboxes, to a number measured in um, trillions per year. 
and that's related also, of course, to the number of social media users on the right. And uh, here are again related uh, curves to this, this number of smartphones. Of course, the number of smartphones, well, I mean, that, you know, it's already up to almost half of the people in the world and people don't find, I don't find it terribly, I don't think I need two smartphones. So um, smartphones are, are, are plateaued. Their capabilities are not plateaued. I'm sure they'll get much better. Wi-Fi is increasing in its, in its reach. Cellular data, that is really increasing fast. Um, I had to buy an unlimited data subscription because otherwise my daughter bankrupted because she kept on subscribing to things. So actually I liked it myself because I, I, I can now do things which I without restriction. But um, anyway, and here's of course the, uh, the, the actual power of the computer, the quality of the computer and these things is um, going up and we now know that the smartphone has a computer which is as powerful as supercomputers as to not so long ago. Here's, an in, here's a, a graph which is done in various forms. This is the latest one I have. This comes from 2019 and <clears throat> here we are in zettabytes and um, this is the amount of data, told, new, the total new data per year. Uh, and um, this is increasing dramatically. It's up to, in this case here, 2025, up to 180 zettabytes. And um, this particular thing, well, I highlighted 2018. I don't certain, it was a 2019 internet trends. And um, this fraction here is the uh, fraction of structured data, how much of the data is structured and organized and how much is totally disorganized. And the amount that's organized is for some, I'm not quite certain why increasing. Uh, but the annual volume measured in zettabytes is a dramatic effect. Notice a zettabyte is a hundred, I'm sorry, a million petabytes. Here is another um, nice graph which tells you about the edge. If we look here, we have in the middle of the clouds, which are the data centers. So when I, nowadays, because I live in a world where I have to be cognizant to the, some of my friends in, uh, talk about supercomputers and some talk about clouds, <coughs> I try to cover myself by talking about data centers because data centers can hold either supercomputers or clouds. And the difference between a supercomputer and a high performance computing cloud is not so obvious. Anyway, we have data centers. And we saw earlier a slide from Cisco, there were over 500 so-called hyperscale data centers. Then we have the edge and that's, uh, so an edge could be the, your, your favorite uh, car, connected car. And then we have the endpoint, and that endpoint could be the brakes on your car or you yourself with your smartphone. So, and then, but, so we have the edge of the uh, macro, non-trivially cluster of computing capabilities trying to solve a problem on the edge. And I've already pointed out that that's gonna be seen in cars because um, that's what cars have, probably a thousand computers in them and um, hundreds and maybe even thousands of sensors. And they're organized to, to make that car the most, in, most effective car possible. They then talk to the cloud so that all cars can link together and then you get so-called transportation systems, which we could discuss, which are built around the world of connected cars. Anyway, this is a pretty useful graph which really explains what's going on and why the computer and the edge are linked together. I think I'm gonna, let me just, I wanted to do one thing, I'll come back. Before I leave today, I wanted to do this curve, which is about deep learning. 
And this is a, car, a graph of the uh, computing needs, uh, the increase in computing needs and the increase in hardware performance. And here we are, here's deep learning started. Uh, uh, I mean, the, I don't think these are absolutely normal. This is just relative to some previous state. And you can see deep learning is increasing in, in its use, in its needs much more than the, the basic hardware available is, which is, this is a slow increase. And um, it's already very hard because as you saw, Intel ran into trouble because they couldn't produce their next, next, next side. I think it was a seven nanometer uh, technology and uh, the Taiwanese company is, is doing it just fine. So that's very competitive. And IBM also did it. They also produced seven nanometer, but not Intel. So the hardware performance is getting harder and harder to get because you're at such small distance scales that uh, it's not so easy to um, to make that, to make, either to make, this, to make that jump and also to make it, um, um, effectively. And so notice these are quite big effects. This is a factor of a thousand from here to here. So over just the, uh, this five year period, deep learning's compute needs have gone up a factor of a thousand uh, faster than the available computing. And so that's why you live in this world where clouds are dominantly, both the edge and the clouds, I told you, uh, te uh, Tesla, I'm not there, but at least Tesla has its own computers. <coughs> but Nvidia works with many car companies and puts a GPU in every car to do their computing. So this computing power is dominated, is satisfied by the edge and the cloud put together. All right, so that's a good time to uh, ending point. I will completely record this uh, slide set and put it up on the web over the weekend. I will be put up on YouTube. So let's go offline and before we have to end at 10.40, we can at least see if there are any questions. There are three chats, let's see what they say. There are no textbooks, as far as I know. Yes, everything is, I will make everything available. I won't put the Zoom on, I will not put the chat, I will put the Zoom on the IU resource. Yeah, technology, I think, is, is on the plateau of productivity because cloud technologies, I remember we were looking at in a very early style where service areas did architectures in 2008. Actually, that was the thing I used to work on for, under the rubric of grid computing. That was all built around service-oriented architectures. And so that was plateau of productivity in 2008. Any other questions? Edge AI is my my uh, uh, Nvidia GPU sitting in your in your self driving car. That's Edge AI, and that self driving car is has its sensors, which is taking lidar and and ordinary video. It's taking images. It's analyzing those images to to do collision avoidance, follow the um, road the uh, road lanes and things like that. The data deluge is just the, those early two graphs showing that the, the amount of data per time is increasing dramatically. We're just flooded with data pouring down on us. That's the data deluge. People don't, I say that was a ter term probably of 10 years ago. It's still true, but people now believe in the data deluge. 10 years ago, it was non-trivial. I used to give talks why, explaining why the data deluge was, was inevitable. Now I don't give those talks. It's, a, it's agreed to be inevitable. All right, we'll meet, to get, we'll meet again for a discussion. I, I'm not certain I, will, I may continue this talk or if I've recorded it properly, we'll just do that. The proper recordings will be put on YouTube. And there will be a playlist solely for this class. Okay, if you send, please, if you want my personal attention, it's best to send me email.
gcf at iu.edu and you will find them if you look at my various things at gmail which i also actually everything goes to gmail but gcf at iu.edu is the shortest shortest email i have and that gets directly sent to my gmail okay thank you very much send me questions i really need to know how best to do this class Piazza is used for class-oriented group, group, group communication and discussion. <coughs> Especially for projects. Because we don't like the Canvas version and uh, email is probably not quite as good as uh, Piazza. Piazza is a focused discussion for this class. Uh, if there is someone there that has a question concerning Piazza or want to create a Piazza account, you can do this now and uh, we can see if you have access to Piazza once your IU email is being associated with the Piazza.com account. Yeah, a, Piazza is very similar to Slack in my opinion and I remember one, one company I work with, they said that uh, they viewed Slack as clearly increasing their productivity compared to email. And actually using Slack cut back their email enormously. Um, there's a question, can we use Slack here? Uh, we have used Slack in the past uh, for this class. What we found is this, uh, this Slack works only if people are using proper etiquette on Slack. It doesn't work when uh, people continuously sending private email messages to for example, Jeffrey, because the entire class will not benefit from this. So Jeffrey and I will have a discussion uh, on this. And for this reason, Piazza is typically the better system for classes than for Slack. Slack works well for projects, but it seemed not to work well for students because they seem to be tending to do all the communication on a private channel. And then uh, no one in class will learn anything. So Jeffrey and I will have a discussion, I guess, to make sure should we use Piazza. At this time we use Piazza. Yeah, I mean, I'm neutral on Slack versus Piazza. I, I, most of my other work uses Slack, but I, I, Greg has had more experience in class use than me, and he, he points out that his experience is the Piazza is better. They're pretty similar conceptually. There is a question concerning grading for undergraduate students that just came in. Uh, second to the last one. What do you mean majority grade? Most people get good grades on this course, if that's the question. Yeah, I guess like my question is, um, would the majority of the grade like be coming from projects that we do or is there going to be any like vocab or any information from these lectures that we would necessarily need? Oh, the fraction of, I forget whether it's 60% uh, homework, 40% projects, it's, it's roughly that ratio. Okay, thanks. And for undergraduates, you can do the project either as software or as a, or as a report. Okay. Graduate students, you have to do a software project. Has to be some software in the project.
Well, you have, graduates have to have software if they want to get the largest possible grade. They can do a, they can get a reasonable grade if they do a report, but not the top grade. Okay, I'm going to take the um, um, take the Zoom offline. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.